In this video, we're going to start to talk about experimental and theoretical probability. Now, our objective, very simply, is to be able to figure out what is experimental probability and how do you calculate it, and then what is theoretical probability and how do you calculate it. Now, we have some terminology that we need to get used to. The first one is what is called an outcome. An outcome is the possible result of a situation or an experiment. For example, if I flip a coin, okay, coins have heads and tails, the outcome would be the result that I get when I flip it. If I flip a coin and I get a heads, the outcome is heads, all right? An event is a single outcome or a group of outcomes. We have this thing that is called a sample space. A sample space is a set of all possible outcomes. We're going to talk about that in a little bit when we talk about what are the outcomes going to look like if we roll two die, okay? And then we come to this thing called probability, all right? Probability, by definition, is the outcomes in a sample space are equally likely to occur than the probability of an event, known as P of an event, is has to be some numerical value between 0 and 1 that measures the likelihood of an event occurring. Now, this is a definition that I have come up with that I have used ever since I was introduced to probability. And very simply, here's the way I look at it. The probability of an event, I always think of as success over total. All right, whether I'm dealing with an experiment, which we're going to talk about in a second, or theoretically, the probability of an event is success over total has enabled me to get through most probability questions without a lot of difficulty. So I highly encourage you committing that to memory. Probability of an event is success over total. Experimental probability is probability still. So it's still success over total, but it's what you get based on actually doing an experiment. If I roll the die 10 times, if I flip a coin 50 times, and I record all those data points, that is what is known as an experiment. And then probabilities that I get based off of that experiment is what we call experimental probability. Let me give you an example. And this is actually, guys, how it's really used in the real world. The first one, it says a quality control inspector samples 500 LCD monitors and finds defects in three of them. First question, what is the experimental probability that a monitor selected at random will have a defect? We did an experiment. That quality control inspector looked at samples and did an experiment. So we know that the probability of a defect would be how many defects we had or the success out of how many things we looked at or our total. In this case, we had 500 LCD. We're done. That's the probability. All right. Now they say it has to be somewhere between zero and one. Well, let's see. Three divided by 500. Yep, that's between zero and one, 0 0.006. All right. How they can take this experimental probability and apply it to more product, for example, would be in question B here. If the company manufactures 15,240 of those monitors in a month, based on what the quality control inspector looked at, how many do we feel are going to be defective? All right. Well, in order to do this, what we want to do is set up a proportion. I know that defect over total would equal defect over total. So we're using this idea of the probability of a defect to now figure out or approximate at least get a good guess for how many we think are going to be defective. All right, so if I cross multiply here, I have three times 
15,240. Divide that by 500. And that says 91.44. All right. Now we come into the question. All right. If they say 91.44, does that mean 91 or 92? Well, if they round it numerically, it would be 91. But I'm also looking at that point four is really saying that there's more than 91 defective. So based on this, how many are likely? I would say that there are 92 defective. And remember, this is a probability. This gives us a good, accurate measurement, but not necessarily perfect. All right. We could measure it out and only have 50 of them that are defective if we looked at all 15,240 of them. This is based on our experiment, how many we believe to be defective. Here's another example. A park has 538 trees. You're not going to go out and look at every one of the 538. You pick 40 at random and determine that 25 are maple. So what is the probability of looking at a tree in this park and it being maple? Well, the probability of maple would be 25, success, over 40 total trees I looked at. Now, we can leave it as 25 over 40, but remember, if they just ask for the probability, you may have to write it as a decimal. You may have to write it as a simplified fraction. If I simplify this fraction, I know it would be 5 over 8. Then it goes on to say about how many trees in the park are likely to be maple. I'm going to take that probability, 5 over 8. There were 5 maple out of every 8 trees I looked at. All right? So maple over total equals maple over total sets up for me a proportion that I can solve. So if I take that information, 5 times 538 divided by 8, that tells me 336.25. And again, there's arguments on both sides of this. I always like to say that that's telling me there are 337 maple trees. All right. Based on my experiment, that's what I believe to be true in this park. Now, the second type of probability we want to talk about is called theoretical probability. Theoretical probability is based on the likelihood of an event occurring. For example, if I flip a coin, the probability of getting a heads is one half. The probability of getting a tails is one half. If I roll a number cube or a die, there are six sides to that die. What's the probability I get a three? One out of six. Why? There's only one three on the die. What's the probability that I roll a five? One out of six. But how about this? What's the probability that I roll an even number? All right. Well, two, four, and six are even numbers on that number cube. So that would be three success out of six total sides, which would reduce to one half. All right. So I kind of explained right here, just in case anybody did not know, a standard number cube is a die. Okay. Uh, if you're not sure on that, let me know, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you what it looks like. All right, the complement of an event. Now, what the complement of an event is saying very simply is this. It's all the pop possible outcomes in a sample space, space that are not part of the event. All right? So the complement would be like what doesn't work, okay? So the probability of rolling less than a 3 on a number cube. Well, on a number cube, how many numbers are less than three? Okay. We got the number one and the number two, so that would be two out of six possible outcomes 
or one third. What a complement is, is when they bring in this word not. What is the probability of not rolling a number less than three? All right. And there's a couple of different ways that you could go about this. The way that I always like to say is, okay, the complement is the not. So I know if the success is one out of three, then not having success would be two out of three. Or if you look at the two over six, it would be four of the six. All right. And here's how I know this. I know that if you take the probability of an event and add to the probability of a not or the complement, they have to add up to one. One third plus two thirds is one third. Which also allows me, if I know the probability of an event, I could take one minus one third to also find the probability of its complement. All right. Now, I took the liberty of going ahead and making this sample space. If I were to roll two number cubes, all right, and what this is saying is I could roll a one and a one, a one and a two, a one and a three, and that pattern kind of continues. If I look over on the far right hand side here, that's saying the first number cube came up with six, the second one came up with one. All right, now. When I look at all these, I have to notice, first of all, what would my total be for rolling six number cubes, or sorry, two number cubes. And that would be a total number of outcomes of six possibilities for the first die times six possibilities for the second die, or 36 outcomes. Now, we're going to learn down the road, this is known as the fundamental principle of counting, all right? And it says if you take the possible outcomes of one thing and multiply it with the possibilities of another thing, that gives you the total possibilities. Like I said, we're going to talk about that down the road a little bit. Okay. If I wasn't sure, I'd write down all of the sample space. And I know in the sample space there were 36 outcomes. Now, the question that we have for this says what's the probability of rolling numbers that add to seven? when rolling two number cubes. Well, I already highlighted one of them. If I roll a six and a one, I get seven. How about five and two, four and three, three and four, two and five, and one and six? Those are the only times that I can roll two number cubes and get a sum of seven. All right? So, out of these 36 different outcomes, I know the probability of sum of 7 would be success over total. And I could reduce that to 1 6, or I could change it into a decimal form if I am asked to. All right. How about the probability? How about the probability of, I'm going to kind of use these, but so we can still see our sample space right in here. What's the probability of a sum of nine? Hold on just a second. Let me write this correctly. Probability of a sum of nine. Well, if you notice in here, everything kind of runs along diagonals. Three, six, four, five, five, four, and six, three. Those are the only times that I'm going to get a sum of 9. That was 4 out of 36, which reduces to 1 ninth. How about the probability of a sum of 2? When's the only time you get a 2? When you got two 1s. So that would be 1 time out of the 36. Well, how about the probability of 13? When do you get a sum of 13? Never. All right? So the probability here would be zero. There's no way that you can get it. All right? So here's another one. Let's say that the bag contains the letter titles that spell out the name of the state, Mississippi. Find the theoretical probability. I always like to underline that of drawing on a tile at random for each of the following scenarios. Okay, 
So Mississippi, let's count the letters first. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We know that there are eleven letters in Mississippi. I just had to double check my addition there. All right, what's the probability of an M? Probability, I'm thinking success over total. There's one M out of 11 letters. What's the probability of an I? Count the number of I's in Mississippi. That would be four out of 11. How about the probability of an S? Again, that would be four out of 11. Now, what about the probability of not M? Well, I know that that would be able to be found by taking 1 minus the probability of M. Or this would give me 10 out of 11. How about the probability of not S? Well, I could take 1 minus the probability of S, which was 4 out of 11. 1 minus 4 out of 11 would be 7 out of 11. How about the probability of not P? Well, that's going to be 1 minus, uh-oh, I don't know the probability of P. But that's okay, I can find it pretty easily. There's two P's out of 11, so the probability here would be 9 out of 11. We've got a jar that contains 10 red, 8 green, and 5 blue, and 6 white marbles. What's the probability that the marble is not green? Probability, success over total, but it's a complement, not green. All right, so let's see. First of all, if I add 10, 8, 5, and 6, that would be 16, 27 is my total. Let me double check my arithmetic there. 18 and 5, oh, I was wrong, wasn't I? 18 and 5 is 23. 23 and 6 would be 29 total. All right, what's the probability that it is not green? So the probability of not green, I'm going to use the complement, which would be 1 minus the probability it is green. 8 out of 29, which would give me a probability of 21 out of 29. And like I said, again, you could change these to decimals, all right? If you're going to leave it as a fraction, you want to simplify that fraction, all right? It's going to depend on MathXL how they ask the question. All right, next one. What's the probability that it is not red, all right? So probability of not red would be... 1 minus the probability it is red, 10 out of 29, which would leave me with 19 out of 29. All right, let's take a look one more here. All right, this was just uh, down the bottom, all those numbers. That was my sample space that I wrote and then brought it up into, uh, into the notes. All right, it says find the theoretical probability. All right. First of all, do you notice that there are eight possible outcomes? And each one of those is li as likely to occur as the other. All right, so number one here says, what's the probability of an even number? On this, we have the numbers 2, 4, 6, and 8. So success would be 4 out of 8, which would reduce to 1 half. Probability of a green, uh, no, sorry, probability of a number greater than 5. Well, we've got the number 6, 7, and 8 on there, so that would be 3 out of 8. And then the third one, the probability of a prime number. By definition, a prime number is any number that is only divisible by itself and 1. All right, so our prime numbers here would be 2, 3, 5, and 7. 2, 3, 5, and 7, so that's going to be 4 out of 8, which again would reduce to 1 half. All right, I hope this helps everybody. Let me know if you have any questions.